Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you are today. Today's webinar is going to be focusing on the need to set up a PMO along with the growth of Agile. So our webinar is going to be focusing on some of the important information about how a PMO should be set up and why a PMO should be set up as well. For those of you that do not know me already, my name is uh, Dr. Sridham Rajkopalan. I'm currently working as an enterprise agile evangelist with uh, Infectra Corporation. I have a doctoral degree in organizational management and leadership, MBA in management, master's in computer engineering, and a bachelorate in electronics and communication engineering. Um, I started my journey as a software engineer, I continued along um, the career curve as a team leader, business analyst, project manager, scrum master, agile coach, and I have served in the capacity of a director and vice president of program management office as well. I have a number of different certifications to my credential, which include portfolio management, program management, project management, schedule management, risk management, agile, scrum, in Scrum Master and Scrum Product Owner and Scrum Developer and a uh, number of other capacities. I'm also an uh, instructional designer, speaker, writer, and author. I have a facilitation experience in a number of institutions um, in the United States, India, United Kingdom, Canada, Switzerland, Brazil, and uh, Vietnam. And I have a book that I just recently released. It's called Organized Common Sense, uh, talking about why project management skills apply to everyone. Uh, that recently came out. So if you um, uh, go to Amazon, you should be able to check out Organized Common Sense and look at my book. And it demonstrates how project management principles is a life skill. Um, and it's written for non-project managers regardless of, the, regardless of their field of choice. Um, I give a lot of numerous tips um, on how to increase productivity personally as well as you know professionally. Today's webinar is part of our four-part series on the fourth webinar series. Um, we started a journey into Agile with Inflectra a few uh, months back, and we've been having this uh, webinar series. Each webinar is approximately about an hour long. We will reserve time at the end for questions. So if you have any questions, please use the chat window to um, type your questions. Um, we will reserve time at the end for the questions. The webinars may introduce the concept using a tool. In today's webinar, I'm not planning to introduce any specific tool per se. So the four part series, uh, for the fourth series, um, we had four different uh, webinars. Uh, we are in the last uh, leg of our four part series. Uh, why is setting up a PMO necessary with the growth of Agile? Earlier, we had talked about uh, the top five techniques to manage programs and portfolios, metrics in the brand new world of programs and portfolios. And then last, uh, we discussed about Scream for Scrum or screen at, Scream at Scrum, what's going on. So let's focus on today's webinar, which is going to be setting up a PMO, uh, why that is necessary. Uh, we owe a lot of our project management principles to the defense industry. Um, I'm not specifically picking one particular defense department, uh, but in general, um, you know, Gantt charts, uh, the program evaluation and review techniques, and some of the principles against project management. We owe a lot to the defense department in how they did so many different things. And the pro Project Management Office is also uh, a component of that. In fact, in 1930, the, the word called Project Office was even discussed as to how the US Air Force started using different parts that needs to be coming together to actually assemble the, um, the plane. Um, so several project management concepts emerge actually from the Defense Department, including PMO. And let's talk about how it, they moved along, you know, in our career uh, profession in the corporate world. So when you look at why projects fail or succeed, uh, there was a, a study recently done from uh, Project Management Institute, and they talked about a number of different reasons. They categorize, you know, primarily champions who are having, you know, very good structured processes and, you know, repeatable successes and all those things. And those that were not necessarily doing well, so underperformance and champions. So they had these things. So when you looked at all of them, 88% of the projects are completed on time, 90% of the projects are completed within the budget for champions, and 92% of them met the original goals and things like that. Um, similarly, when you looked at their underperformance, there was at least you know one third of them which were not which were not meeting the criteria. 
But one of the important things that if you look at, 81% of them have a PMO. Um, and again, depending upon whether you use uh, the context of a project program and portfolio, PMO could mean you know project management office, program management office, or portfolio management office. Sometimes even a P3O office. But you know, let's define our terms right now to project management office within a PMO context. And when you look at this, 81 percentage of them claim to have a PMO, and they all had the enterprise PMO. Um, highly aligned with the organizational strategy. And we've been talking about these kind of elements all along in our in our webinar series, like you know, the alignment to strategy is very important and things like that. And almost half of them were using some flavor of agile as well. They frequently use agile. Doesn't mean they always use agile, they frequently use agile. Now, if you scroll to the last uh, four important elements that are listed over here, prioritize the development of leadership skills, prioritize technical skills development, prioritize development of strategic and business management skills, and prioritize the development skills of executive sponsors. So if you have looked at some of the previous um, webinars where we have constantly been talking about the need for executive sponsorship to understand the, the, um, the spectrum of uh, where we are working and how we are uh, working and all the frameworks and things like that, that's very important. So we need to be able to focus on the leadership skills of not only the executive sponsors, uh, but also the team members on you know, cross-functional domains. Right. But what's really happening? So when you look at this in 2017, approximately ninety seven million dollar was wasted um, due to poor project performance for every billion dollars. That's approximately about, uh, you know, um, 10 percentage of the money was getting lost. Right. And so as we moved along in 2019, PMI reported that, um, you know, one million dollar is wasted every 20 seconds due to project you know, poor performance. So those are all very telling statistics at this point. But we have been talking about Agile for quite some time, but how has Agile solved these challenges? Because we come back and say, you know, Agile, we limit the scope to the two week or three week duration by using the principle of time boxing. And, you know, we are able to uphold quality and all those things. So how has uh, Agile really solved this uh, challenge, this dilemma, right? So why is a PMO needed with the growth of all these Agile? You know, Agile Manifesto was written um, approximately now two decades back, you know, 2001. Um, and it had those four important principles uh, called the Agile Manifesto principle that we had talked before, right? So when you look at those statistics, the reasons for going Agile according to the version one, um, I'm comparing the last two years, 2018 and 2019, um, accelerating software delivery managing change, increasing productivity, better business IT alignment, and increased software quality. Those were the you know, uh, underpinning reasons for going to Agile. But when you look at this, the trend is not actually you know, in the positive direction. Um, increased software quality is um, 46 percentage, and it is reduced now to 43 percentage. So what is this telling? If you're limiting the scope to two weeks and three weeks, we should have zero defects. You know, we should not be having all these software quality problems at all. So we are trying to accelerate fast, but not necessarily realize the software quality that we really need. And we are trying to say we are increasing the productivity of the team in a siloed fashion. But when you look at the alignment between business and IT, that's actually you know reducing or you know not necessarily at the, the, the rate we need we need to. So when we talk about individuals and um, interactions uh, over um, you know uh, processes and tools, where is this uh, alignment going wrong? So it really makes us think like, you know, we need to come down with what is uh, really required and how do we get in, you know, everybody uh, bought into this whole paradigm, right? So we need to address these uh, challenges. When you look at this, PMI further reported additional information. And this is a, a different view of what I, I showed you before, but across the different countries. So looking at all the different countries that PMI studied, when you look at this, um, approximately 10 percentage of the money is getting wasted. So the amount of millions of dollars wasted by region for every billions of dollars. When you look at US and U U US at this point, that's about 102. That's again another you know, 10 percentage of the money. 
So we seem to be adopting more and more Scrum and more and more Agile flavors and more and more all those things. But, you know, the previous slide talked about, you know, how more and more, you know, the alignment is missing qualities, you know, dropping and all those things. So this is one of the reasons why people come to these things expecting that this is going to be a cure-all, but then they find out that it's not a cure-all because uh, of many reasons. So that's the reason why we have to move forward to some kind of a structured processes as well. So when you're looking at this, at the end of the day, projects, programs, and uh, portfolios are expected to produce capabilities, outcomes, benefits, and values. So strategy to execution is very important. At the end of the day, if those two don't align, we are not going to you know, solve the problem. So Project Management Institute came down with what is called the standard uh, of how projects, program, and portfolios work together. So when you look at this, the vision, mission, the organizational strategy, and then how operations are supposed to work and planning uh, for project and portfolio management, and how the ongoing operation, operations as well as the, the programs and projects, they have to work together. This is all supported by the organizational resources. Seems to be a very you know good uh, blueprint over here. But when you look at this additional information, the structured PMO is the foundation behind how the strategy to execution is going to be met. So what do I mean by a structured PMO? These, uh, the structured PMO has to support four important components, which is going to be the uh, PMIS, Project Management Information System, which is going to be the, the technology-driven uh, um, business platform that provides information for project managers, uh, as well as um, you know, different uh, members of the Agile team to work together, right? And then their knowledge has to be managed. We are coming up with all these lessons learned, retrospective, and all those things. But so what? How are we actually you know learning from them? Um, how are we reducing the the challenges that are associated with them. So how is this knowledge being propagated within the organization? The next one is going to be audit support, making sure that we are actually applying all of these things within our own structure, making sure that we are serving as a quality champions, keeping quality as a design element. And finally, education and training as new members come, existing members go, as new uh, platforms come, new technology comes, new tools come. You know, we need to constantly on this uh, continuous improvement mindset on how do we do this. So a structured PMO should bring all these four elements together very cohesively. And if that's not the case, then the PMO is not serving the purpose. Right. And this is another reason why Agile will also have challenges, because if Agile does not bring all these four elements together, Agile will also have, um, you know, uh, eyebrows getting raised from stakeholders. So let's talk about why then a PMO is really required at this point. At the end of the day, as I mentioned, you know, project is the in the the. the most important integral component, the lowest granular level of work that needs to be done by a project management office, right? So a PMO is taking into account two important elements, which is going to be organizational strategy on the one end. How am I actually trying to deliver value um, for the strategy through the vehicle of projects? And then how am I actually, you know, continuously sustaining the benefits um, and value uh, through operation management. So both those two elements are supposed to be part of the project management office as we are delivering projects. At the end of the day, we are delivering capabilities, but if those capabilities do not translate into revenue, do not translate into value, we have not accomplished anything by uh, project management. Right? It does not matter what delivery framework at this point do you use. We need that PMO, right? And so when you look at this, this PMO is the one that interfaces with everything, so the close of every phase. I'm not saying every project because a project may be a multi-phase element. By definition, it's progressive elaboration, right? So we need to actually have that particular piece from a project. But then the organizational strategy may be uh, the one that is telling like, okay, what are the new products that we have to be developing based upon the market needs and the customer needs? And similarly, how do we support them until the end of the product life cycle? And operations management may be taking into account the existing product management and also improving the process efficiency. Both the process and the product is now part of the PMO. And that level of uh, you know, granularity does not exist when you take one particular approach and just run with that, like management by projects. Right. So growth of PMO has been evolving too. So since 2007, when you look at this, you know, across all uh, firms, 
uh, whether it is small firm, medium firms, or large firms, they are seeing the growth of PMO. 61 percentage of the small firms are having project management office at this point, and 88 percentage of the medium-sized firms are having project management office of some shape or form. And 90 percentage of the large firms really feel a need for a PMO to govern everything around the project delivery framework. Right. So there is. Uh, a trend that we can see how project management office is also growing as we are trying to come up with different ways of delivering projects through different project delivery frameworks, right? So let's get us ourselves grounded a little bit more again on the portfolio program and projects. At the hierarchical level from the previous diagram that I showed, you know, projects are producing, um, you know, out capabilities to the programs. Program is taking into account a lot of additional things and then projects and programs are contributing to portfolio. So projects at the minimum are uh, managing the efforts to develop specific scope um, within a program or a portfolio. So basically, as I mentioned, it's a specifically delivering a capability. But a program is a coordinated management of related projects to achieve some specific strategic business value, you know, specific business value alone. Uh, for it may be a, a small group of departments or maybe, you know, uh, three or four departments together or some specific um, um, product that is going to be in, uh, instrumental for the company and things like that. Right. So the two elements that actually connect both these projects and programs um, or differentiates them is going to be the level of change and the level of uncertainty. And again, the level of change in level of uncertainty is baked into the way we even think about agile. Right. So these are actually part of the progressive elaboration, incremental iterative delivery that we already, you know, be talking about even in the context of project management office. Right now, when you are trying to look at the portfolio, it identifies, selects, prioritizes, optimizes, and balances. You know all the different initiatives and all the different resources that we have available based upon the strategic enterprise value, not just one business value alone, but enterprise value across the entire organization. What is the way we try to uh, pick, optimize, uh, optimize people and, and non-human? around those initiatives so when you look at that the fitness and the time come into play you know they put it off they are related to building the skills and all those things also coming into play in the pro and program uh, okay so what are some of the core pieces that the pmo has to provide so let's start you know unpeeling this uh, elements at this point so first it needs to look at the start so not one size of it. Um, so you take a look at the specific nature of the project and then evaluate which delivery framework will be applicable. You know, it could uh, lend itself to, um, you know, traditional project management or it could lend itself to an agile framework. So you have to take a look at those elements. So the methods, the metrics, the process development and all those things are part of the standards of this. Right. The next one is going to be the delivery management. What is the business goal that we are trying to do? And how are we supposed to sustain this benefit uh, in the long term? Uh, what are the types of resources that we have and what their um, knowledge levels are? What types of risks that we have to manage in addition to the triple constraints? Uh, how do we manage change and communicate them? So all these things are part of the delivery management. Again, if you go with one flavor of project delivery, it's going to be different from another flavor. But depending upon the scope of uh, people that needs to be managed, you probably have to choose a different state of management. Um, delivery management. This one is going to be how do we build a balance so that we are able to constantly position ourselves on the edge of innovation and things like that. And career path management, career development, cards, and all those things. You need to take a look at all those elements as well. Training becomes one vehicle of choice at this point uh, as well. Then administration, so the different tools that we are bringing in, how do we provide internal consultation, uh, how all these tools are working together, uh, what kind of uh, application lifecycle management we are bringing together so that we can also look at the total cost of ownership, uh, so customer service management. So a lot of things come into the administrative of the PMO as well. Then the change. 
that's the organizational change management that we have to start looking at. So how do we manage you know, multiple stakeholders? How do we manage multiple stakeholder engagement? What are some of the way we can address their conflicts and resistance? Um, readiness assessment, uh, you know, before we go forward with uh, a particular product for beta launch and alpha launch and things like that, right? And then finally, looking at governance. So when you are talking about all these different things across a lot of initiatives and things like that, you're know, you looking at performance reporting, issues escalation, compliance, and finance management, all these other elements are starting to come up. But this is not it. You know, sometimes you can have some expanded services based upon how much you are actually moving into the program management and portfolio management. There you are talking about how do we prioritize our, our work um, and our resources based on uh, strategic management. And we talked about in front of the example there's another example as the tools that we actually you know use for benefits and value recognition and prioritization as well and then knowledge management how do you plan for uh, people that are going to be leaving the organization and success planning has to be intellectual and how you can improve that and productivity and so all these things have to be constantly thought through as to how you are taking all knowledge and lessons learned moving the organization forward, future uh, work that may be coming in. The future work is based on the strategic plan. What is the business where we have to be going? What are the environmental related uh, scanning that, you know, the, remember the PESLI that I had talked about, you know, based upon that, what initiatives are we really coming on down, coming down with and how we position ourselves for moving, it, moving them in the right forward uh, path. Right. And then the life cycle management, whatever we are trying to do, how do we manage them across the entire life cycle? Right. Um, making sure that the benefits are properly um, uh, realized through, um, yeah, you know, multiple methods at this point. Um, so how do we make sure that we are managing all these things across the entire life cycle and bring some of those uh, process improvement methodologies, operational excellence and all those things into the fold over here. So this is the whole big core. Uh, of the PMO. And in my um, um, career, I have been fortunate enough to set up uh, a PMO that has uh, comprising pretty much all of these particular elements at a very high level uh, and be able to manage both, uh, you know, internal projects as well as client projects, as well as strategic projects and, you know, change management initiatives, a number of different things. You know, this is what a PMO is actually supposed to, you know, take care of. But that's a lot. Right. We have a lot of information at this point. So how do we go about um, implementing this? And there are five stages in which you can go. And these five stages are broken into three different levels when you implement it, because you don't want to go and implement everything um, if you don't need to implement everything. Right. So at the first level, um, you are call you, you call the PMO as a supporting PMO. So we can differentiate two different stages within this as stage one and stage two. And even stage one has different flavors inside that. Uh, but this is one particular um, PMO structure where you are basically giving some templates, uh, best practices, some level of training, and you become some consulting um, capacity, not necessarily your value will be recognized, but you know, you have some information, right? So most likely you are going to be at this functional level of uh, the project organization at this point. As a result, you have low degree of control. The second stage is going to be more like a controlling PMO. Now here is where we are introducing the stage three PMO structure. Um, and in this particular one, you are having a little bit more than level one. So you are building on level one at this point to say, I will give you additional support. I will validate information against the governance. Uh, so, you know, we will bring some governance structures. We'll bring some issue escalation protocol and all those things. So we have some moderate degree of control. So if when you look at this from a project organization perspective, this is going to be some kind of a matrix uh, organization. So you have some uh, weak metrics or low uh, balanced metrics or strong metrics, you know, depending upon that, it could have different vary, uh, degrees of control that the project manager will have, right? As well as the PMO will have within the organizational structure. Then the third level is going to be the directive structure. And depending upon how it is structured at this point, it could uh, have a lot more 
control on the entire organization and it could be called uh, stage four or stage five. Um, so PMO directly manages the project. So before somebody is actually beginning to work on any initiative, the project management office will be consulted to get the appropriate level of project manager, whether it is a project manager, program manager, portfolio manager, or a, a product owner or a scrum master, you know, whatever it is, you know, we will get from this particular um, and then, you know, move forward. That's going to be uh, the highest degree of control that we can potentially have at this point within the PMO as well as within the um, organization. And when you look at this, when you are coming into the stage two, or level two and level three. So stages three, four, and five, when you have this, you know, PMO is becoming more um, uh, value recognized business entity within the organization. So it becomes uh, a business uh, department itself, right? You know, otherwise it's not going to be very good. Right. So let's expand on how these things manifest itself. So level one. So level one, think of this much more like a, a lifeline support. Uh, this is nothing more than, you know, giving all the different uh, tools um, and necessary tools required for them to deliver the capabilities at this point. You know, like the, the, the block over here, you know, there are so many other tools that are available that are not necessarily put in the support uh, bridge at this point. And so you pick and choose what is really required for that particular initiative. And that's what I call it as a lifeline. But a, a PMO, in, even at this level, should know what are all the other tools that are available for them to pick if they don't have the that knowledge and capability to see what are all the different tools that are available, they're not necessarily going to deliver the value that is going to be recognized. And at this level, you know, if that value proposition is not coming through, people will say, well, you know, I don't see much value there. And, you know, it starts disintegrating at that particular point. So we need to make sure that, you know, we know all the different technologies, tools, and, you know, all those things so that we are able to move forward. And this is all the more reason why a, a person who is setting up to form the project management office, whether uh, level one, level two, or level three, should have some cross-functional skills, you know, multidisciplinary cross-functional skills. Otherwise, that person is going to depend on other people and may pick and choose um, what he or she wants and may not necessarily provide the value that is required. So this manifests in two different levels. Level one has to be customized based upon the project or the work that we are trying to do, right? So different organizational units may require different needs. So, you know, you I'm sure if you look at some of the um, job descriptions and advertisements and all those things, you know, an, an IT PMO, a HR PMO, a creative department PMO, you know, you will see lots of these different flavors that are coming up. So, uh, PMO office is really required within the IT department alone so that all the IT different projects can be you know, properly done. That's nothing to do with you know, how a PMO exists separately to actually complete all the work. So in this particular case, it's stage one. You know, Each one of them want, recognizes the value of a structured project management office, uh, but they are all within the particular department alone. So an IT person will become more like a project manager, like an acting pseudo project manager, and that person will do all the work uh, but that person may not necessarily be having the knowledge of, uh, you know, all the 10 knowledge areas of project management, different project delivery frameworks and all those things. So these are all, uh, you know, very important. The second approach is going to be the support for each project may need some customization. So even if you have done one project uh, using this approach, when you take on a different project, that may be completely different um, uh, approach that may be required. So this is when you have to look at the project and say, well, this uh, lend itself to a uh, traditional delivery. Well, this uh, does not lend itself to traditional delivery, and we have to move on to a, a different approach. So we need to you know, start looking at those particular patterns all the time. So this is where um, Agile flavors fit in this level, right? So Agile basically is um, saying like, okay, we will do these things and we will customize this for different types of teams. So they are focused on individual teams. They don't look at the entire organization. They look at only those particular uh, Agile team, the Scrum team and things like that. And as you are evolving this to be in a, in a larger business unit level and larger um, organization level, then you are you know, getting into the enterprise Agile. Uh, or, you know, uh, the scrum of scrum and all those things are coming up. But initially, when you are focusing on this, it's going to be very, very small focused on individual teams. And that's when um, challenges come because if they are actually investing in technology and tools without necessarily consulting the total cost of ownership, then things go wrong. And if they are not aligned with the actual value of the, uh, the strategy, then, you know, things don't uh, necessarily materialize. 
at the end of the day, Agile also has to adapt to fit the larger levels. And you see how um, the market has actually picked up, right? You have come up with disciplined Agile, um, safe, um, you know, uh, so many different things, the dad and less and, you know, so many different things are coming up primarily because Agile also has to adapt to grow to a different levels at this point. Right. So that's primarily level one. OK, now level one may take different forms. Right. It could be a project office or a program office. And I call them one year, one D over here um, just because of the level of support it gives to a specific project or a specific program, which has a lot more than you know one project. So it gives templates and support for a single project, um, whereas uh, in the program office, it gives support for governance, some resource optimization and you know how things will work in operations and things like that that are very specific to the program because program includes uh, operations as well. Uh, projects do not. Right. Both the project office and program office are temporary in nature. Okay. Uh, as soon as the project is done, as soon as the program is done, you know, the project uh, PMO that we created is also going to go away. And that's why we call it a project office and a program office, and we don't even call them PMO at this point. So th that's how it fits in. Now, this, the second stage too is the basic PMO. You know, it hasn't proved itself, but you know, people are realizing the value at this point and we want to do something. And so basic PMO is getting formed over here. And that's why I'm calling it semi-permanent because we see the value of it uh, and we want to, you know, increase that. And so it provides a lot more standardization so that, you know, projects have repeatable success. And they follow, you know, a specific methodology, whether it is um, agile or, you know, other things, you know, it follows some specific methodology so that you are able to repeat success um, and, you know, avoid the same mistake that happened with some other projects. Right, so that's the basic PMO. So the level one PMO delivers a few things. So at the stage one, um, some standards, some delivery, some talent management, some administration will come into play. But stage one does not focus on a number of other things like you know organizational change, governance. Um, how do we plan strategically and why are we making certain decisions about when to release certain functionality or not release certain functionality? How do we manage that across the life cycle uh, after we have delivered? Um, element about the portfolio. Um, we talked about uh, you know some of those uh, differentiating factors before. And how do we constantly manage knowledge across the enterprise, not specifically within one particular project, but how do we translate that knowledge um, our lessons learned across the entire organization. So level stage one does not deliver these things, okay? But when you are looking at stage two, a little bit more additional things are coming into uh, what uh, is getting delivered. So again, we include those basic stuff, administ administration, talent management, delivery, and standards. But then we are bringing some of the knowledge management and life cycle management into this. Um, so you are basically trying to ensure some um, some process exists for how you move from stage one to stage two. And, and, and so stage two does not deliver organizational change, governance, um, planning and portfolio management because um, the voice, the value of you, the basic PMO voice is not completely understood um, across the management space, right? So when management space comes up, decisions are getting made. Uh, PMO doesn't have a watch at that point and it takes some time before you can actually prove your value as you are moving into the next level, which is going to be the level two. And in level two, you are seeing some good value that is coming out of the organization, uh, the PMO organization. And so the knowledge from all these lessons learned are getting um, promoted across the entire organization to say, well, you know, predictable performance has to come, whether it is client driven projects or internal initiatives or new product or existing product enhancements, whatever it is. So we are extending a lot more additional control. Right. Just like, you know, you follow certain patterns, certain particular uh, ways of doing things, you know, even the Ruby Cube can be solved. Right. So similar approach. How do you incorporate all those lessons? Um, and uh, you know, move forward with uh, more predictability, and that's what is really required for an organization. You know, predictable um, um, throughput, right? So, level two. When you're looking at level two, what are some of those critical things that we need to actually uh, make sure that that PMO delivers, right? And that is project delivery framework. So you cannot come here at this point and say, "Well, I'm going to always use Agile." All 
problems are only going to be solved with Agile or all problems are going to be solved only with Scrum or all problems are going to be solved only with uh, you know, traditional project delivery uh, framework. Can you have to come up with you know, a lot of different project delivery framework and you should be able to customize that within your organizational context. You can go back and say, well, you know, some other team used uh, 200 story points and now I'm going to use the same 200 story points. You know, that team used uh, affinity estimation, I'll use this. That team did not use top-down estimation, I will not. Do. So you cannot do this. You know, you have to come up with all the different tools. So the, the, the toolbox have to be completely ready both in terms of the, the tools that needs to be available to support your work, as well as the knowledge uh, that you need to have available to actually you know, pick the right tool for the right uh, project, right? Only then you will be able to look at the program level benefits management, like you know how multiple projects are adding value and how all of them are getting integrated and how value is getting recognized through the customers, um, through, uh, you know, reducing the spending through en enhancing the uh, the revenues and things like that, right? Um, so the program level benefits management comes up. And then the knowledge management. You don't want uh, people to leave the organization and you are actually you not know, taking the organization 10, um, 10 years back. You know, you want to constantly be prepared for people leaving the organization voluntarily or involuntarily. Um, and so you are building the knowledge and you are also building the knowledge for what could potentially be coming to the pipeline. Right. Um, so people may not be leaving, but, you know, at the end of the day, you still have to you know, prepare the organization. So if we are all moving into some new way of doing things, uh, like let's say we are all moving to um, continuous integration and continuous deployment. Um, then we need to have that mentality ready. You know, if uh, uh, if you are moving into that kind of uh, approach, then we have to, you know, properly groom the knowledge as well, groom the talent as well, right? And that's what a standard PMO is, a stage three. So when we are talking about a standard PMO, most of the core services that I talked about are there, right? It may still not have a complete voice from the you know management space but it is recognized it has proven it well its value over here right and so a standard pmo is a little bit more permanent it's not just semi-permanent it's going to be permanent so people are recognizing that and so there is a pmo getting formed project managers report into this organization um not within you know individual um it department or hr department and things like that and it's an extension from stage two Right. So a lot more repeatable process will be formed when tools are being consulted. You know, project management office will have a voice and they will have a voice in recommending the proper quality tools or proper um, dashboard related tools or application lifecycle management tools and things like that. And they will have voice in requirements, analysis, um, test case uh, traceability and all those additional things come into the play over here in terms of, you know, reducing the schedule, rapid uh, um, our test case execution and all those things will come into play over here, right? So now level two PMO is both about product and process. I'm sure you would have already picked up that uh, thread already, uh, but it's more about both product and process. It's not just get delivering the capability, what we deliver, but it is also focusing on how we deliver. And that's the reason why all these automation tools, uh, you know, man ma rapid manual testing, um, you know, better application lifecycle management tools, all those things are all coming into play at this point. In other words, you are focusing on throughput, right? So what are some of those things? So delivery framework has to be understood. So you have to know all the flavors. That's the reason why project managers as well as scrum masters will be reporting, you know, you know into the same um, organization sometimes. Um, so traditional project delivery as well as adapted pro uh, project delivery. And people may pick and choose, like, I want to be only in this particular field. And that's our individual career choice. But the organization is ready with um, people, um, whether they are going to go with this approach or that approach. When the project decision has been made that, you know, we are going to go with Agile or with traditional delivery, we have people to support that process, that project. Right. And then the next one is going to be uh, benefits we talked about. You know, we need to have the benefits management completely tracked at the pro at the pro program level at this point or at the portfolio level. It's much more than project at this point. So how do we bring money at this point? So one of the things that I often ask is, you know, even in an agile context, what's the cost of your iteration? Well, if you're not able to answer that, how can you associate benefits? It's no longer just, you know, time um, box, start iterative delivery alone, but you also have to understand how much it costs the organization, 
And so continuous stakeholder engagement is equally important for us to understand how the organization works. So even at, you know, even for organizations that do agile, sometimes you may have to start thinking in terms of some of those racy tools, the responsible accounted consultative and informed tools, when your work is getting um, absorbed by other organizations who do not follow agile. Right, a legal department uh, may not necessarily follow the agile protocol, but you know when you are giving something for their review, you need to understand how it works. Right. Then the next one is going to be how do you constantly mine the knowledge? What are the knowledge that is getting gathered within your particular project, but across all the particular projects that uh, that is that the organization is working on, and then bring them together. So maybe some other project was using some other tool or some other you know new process, and that process to prove to be much more effective. And so we need to understand that. And so there needs to be that. Um, process value add and technical value add also constantly coming in. Um, so that's the one that's, that sows the seed for operational excellence and you know continuous talent management, right? So when you're looking at all these things, level two PMO builds multidisciplinary cross-functional capability, right? Um, in, in both the people and the infrastructure that you have available. You know, and when I mean infrastructure, the tools and technology is what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, multiple different uh, skills are getting built across the entire organization. Uh, and this positions itself for, you know, much better and, and you know, uh, levels of PMO, right? So level two PMO shows the seeds for a few things. You know, it starts talking in, um, in the change management principles. It starts building you know, its voice into the strategic governance. It is constantly building talent management. Um, so, you know, people do get involved in um, individual personal development and things like that. Um, the life cycle management of the product that you are working on uh, and then um, resulting into the benefits management. So how all these things are getting managed and uh, mapped. So it shows the seeds for all those things. Some things may be working, some things may not be working, but at least you know we are trying to think it through as to how we can make it better. As a result of this, it solidifies the stage two PMO function because now you are working on additional level functions at this point in stage three. So it solidifies some of the things that we have been experimenting. Right? And it delivers not only client-facing projects, but it also expands to internal initiatives because your voice in the as, as a PMO is getting recognized that people come to you and say, I like the way you delivered these projects by managing the expectations and all those things. So I would like you to do the same thing for our internal initiatives, whether it is IT or um, you know strategic level um, merger and acquisition level kind of work or anything like that, right? Uh, but in order for you to have this, the project manager should have you know a lot or pro product managers or scrum masters, you know all of them should have a lot more additional talent. You know, it can come back and say, well, I don't know anything about. Um, you know, cloud, so I can do this. So there needs to be some expansion of skill set and capabilities as well. So it builds process focus to consistently deliver. Again, predictability is the key. If if I go to this PMO and get the people and they will make sure that, you know, all risks are properly identified and, you know, the chances of failure is getting reduced, right? They need to know that. And when you are doing this repeatedly, you are laying the foundation for the stage four, which is the advanced PMO. Right. So let's talk about the stage four at this point, which is part of level three. Now, when you're looking at level three, it's much more about both capacity and capability. Right. Individual capability is getting increased um, uh, by, you know, talent management and all those things. But at the same time, you are also building the organizational capacity for taking, you know, more um, bigger initiatives as well, right? So it's more like the orchestra, you know, you need to be able to manage multiple different things uh, at this point to be able to bring a, a collective good, great performance, right? So if, when this happens, you are in level three, PMO becomes an internal change agent in organizational transformation. So when they are doing, you know, a major merger and acquisition, um, you will have a seat uh, you have the table to talk about this. Um, so, you know, you may become a chief project officer or chief program officer or something like that at that particular point. But your PMO will have a representation where we want to talk about how do we make it happen at this point? You know, should we do this now? And, you know, all those kind of things at this point are coming in. So level three has an organizational footprint much larger than, you know, stage uh, one, two, and three at this point, right? So when you are looking at this, it champions why do something, you know, why are we doing this, 
um, those powerful questions will be focused from the PMO. Why do now? You know, those kind of things. So much more about the systems level thinking that we had talked before about. It comes up with those things. So as a result of that, it is focused on two important things, which is managing change and risk. Right. Remember, you know, those were the underpinning things that were differentiating projects to programs. Right. And then you are moving forward into the next one, which is going to be at least to the factual decision making, no longer like subjective thoughts, but it's a data driven decision making um, facts over fiction. Right. So these members will have a you know, better understanding of statistical data analysis. So they will be moving into some of those decision making based upon prescriptive and predictive data analysis. They will also have um, information about operational excellence. You know, so how things will be better, or how things should be done better and things like that. This is uh, feeding into the knowledge mining and things like that. And then the continuous improvement, you know, the throughput enhancement, the productivity enhancements, you know, we talked about uh, some of the lean principles before. So the Six Sigma lean and all those principles starts coming in uh, as we are trying to, you know, realize benefits and things like that. And then comes how do we sustain this benefit and value? Okay, once we have done this, how do we sustain the value at this point? So that's when you are looking at you know portfolio and program level planning and cross disciplinary collaboration with you know multiple departments and things like that. So you are becoming the change agent within the organization. Um, you 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 are the change agent at this point, right? So level three has this particular level of uh, footprint at this point, and it builds on two important stages. You know, it has stage four, and then it has stage five, right? When you are looking at stage four, it's more like an advanced PMO. So you are building on stage three, so it integrates multiple project delivery um, frameworks uh, around the total cost of ownership. Right. So what tools are getting used, how tools are getting used, you know, how project managers may be able to adapt both to different delivery frameworks and things like that. And it aligns profitability uh, margin um, while keeping the business initiatives in focus. So anytime you are trying to come up with this, uh, you know, new features, new functionality and all those things, you know, this constant of, you know, what does it mean for the business or the, for the customer is always coming up. Right. And it focuses on comprehensive capability of delivery. Right. So it focuses on what are the skill inventory that we need to have two to three years from now, not today, but two to three years from now. What are some of the talent that we need to have within the organization um, and how do we actually enable PMO to um, succeed in that particular space? Right. So even before cloud comes in, we have to actually start thinking in uh, how cloud knowledge can be incorporated, how data analytics can be in incorporated, and, you know, those kind of things have to be um, brought in in stage four, right? And then in stage five, it merges continuous improvement. So you are constantly focusing on, you know, the, the operations and project together. Uh, and you are combining a lot of different frameworks. So you may be a project manager, but you will still be able to use Six Sigma methodology in, in operations. Or you could be a scrum master or an agile coach, and you can still be using some of those uh, data points from, um, um, uh, you know, sampling approaches uh, and, and be able to still come up with uh, how to uh, add new user stories that add value. Right. Which is the point again, Kaizen events. Like, how do you create continuous improvement mindset within the organization? So you become the center of excellence at this point. And as a result of this, you become the change agent. And so you are becoming one of the go to persons for adopting emerging trends. You know, when this new technology is coming, when this new um, machine learning or artificial intelligence based ideas are coming up, you know, you become one of the go to persons, not the go to person, one of the go to persons to say, how do we take this information and incorporate it into our projects and programs? And how do we build the talent to actually do these things? So then you're becoming the center of excellence. So that's when you are moving into these things. So you cannot just like that move to, I'm going to have an agile center of excellence because I do agile and we don't want PMO. There is a structured process in which you have to go through. And the more you are able to pick and choose and uh, you know build the products as well as the process and the people together on this particular uh, continuum, you are um, more into uh, becoming the change agent that you want to be in an organization. Okay. So a lot of times people ask me one, one important question. So I built this over here. Well, now that I you have told me all these things, how do I establish a PMO? And here is my viewpoint on this. This is not uh, 
the end all be all, but here is my PM uh, more experience, right? The first thing is you have to ask what type of PMO is required. You know, are you looking at a short term? Are you looking for a long term? What kind of value proposition you are tra really trying to build for the organization? How the organization is supporting um, your, uh, your positioning statement at this point? All those things are really critical to ask. The second one is going to be how to grow the PMO across the organization. Well, you know, if you have crossed the first stage, then you have to start talking about like, how do I grow the PMO across the organization? So most likely you are now moving into the level two, right? And once you have, you know, proven some value and all those things, then you are moving to the next level as to how do I sustain the value? So in other words, how do you create stickiness within the organization? Um, across all the business units. So that's what you are asking the third question to be. So, you know, level one, level two, level three, you know, that's exactly how I'm structuring it over here. And there are certain things that you have to do. They're not necessarily in any particular order, but define and balance the PMO function. Don't try to, you know, shoot for uh, a stage four PMO when you don't even have a stay, you know, stage one level PMO. Right. So define and balance the PMO function and establish the related and required project management processes. Right. Uh, and then the next one is going to be what are some of the KPIs uh, I had before talked about, like not having too many KPIs and having, you know, just enough metrics to measure the value. Right. So what are some of those things to show the value for the PMO? And then also start looking at what are the talents that you need, the capabilities that you need within the organization and, you know, look at your personal and see how you can grow them. Right. Whether it is through, you know, training or certification or a combination of both of them or whatever it is, you know, so you need to actually, you know, structure them for the PMO value evolution. Okay. And finally, evaluate the PMO value. Things are not always uh, same. You know, things are changing. So your organization will change, your strategy will change and in you know, the market is changing. And so based upon that, what are some of the things that you have to, uh, you know, adapt as a result of that, you know, what performance KPIs have to be um, aligned with your strategy, because at the end of the day, if all the work that you are doing is not adding value to the strategic um, enterprise and strategic business value, then you are uh, not necessarily uh, realizing the benefit that you want for your PMO. So those are you know, some of the high level steps that I have found to be useful um, using uh, my own experience. Okay. So in summary, so level one is supporting and it has two different stages at this point that I talked about. It's uh, basically giving some templates and all those things. And in level two, you are becoming uh, more like the controlling PMO where you are establishing some structured basic PMO processes. Um, and then you are uh, moving into level three, which has you know stages four and five where you could become the uh, um, internal sticky change agent for organizational strategy uh, to be materialized. All right. So I'm wrapping up this point. Uh, so if there are any questions relating to the content that there were, um, please reach out to me. Um, my email is sriram at infector.com. If you have any specific questions on the course administration per se, please reach out to uh, Ms. Thea at uh, marketing at infector.com. Thanks again for watching. And if you are thinking about a question and want to um, send me later, uh, please feel free to email me at sriram at infector.com. Thanks again for watching and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next webinar soon.